This is Eyewitness News up close with Bill Witter. Improving the safety and security of the system is also crucial to our success. These gains in performance are all for naught if riders and employees don't feel safe. That is Sarah Feinberg. You may not know the name, Thank you. but you Good soon afternoon. will be accustomed to it. Feinberg, the interim chief of New York City Transit, the biggest subway and bus system in the country. She takes over for Andy Byford, who was on the job for two years. Coming up, we talk to Ms. Feinberg about what passengers can expect under her new leadership. Also this morning, a former television journalist who has decided now to enter politics. And she's picked one kind of big race for her maiden voyage, challenging one of the most popular members of the freshman class of Congress, Representative from New York, Alexandria Casio cortez So why did Michelle Caruso Cabrera enter this particular race and take on this particular congresswoman, AOC? We're going to ask her that question and more coming up. And good morning, everyone. Welcome to Up Close. I'm Bill Ritter. Who would want to be president of the MTA's New York Transit? be in charge of all those subways, hundreds of them, stations, millions of riders every day. The biggest public transportation system in North America is what the MTA calls it. And then there are New York City buses, more than 4,000 of them, hundreds of millions of riders a year. The last guy, Andy Byford, lasted two years. The new guy isn't a guy. She's the second woman to have this job, and it's only interim. Or is it? Joining us this morning, Sarah Feinberg, the interim president of New York Transit. Welcome to Channel 7. Thank you so Welcome much. Welcome to Up Close for your first time. Thank you so much for having me. When your predecessor was uh, was new at the job, in the first couple of weeks, he came on Up Close and, and made the case. So Smart we welcome man. We welcome <laughs> And And ironically, you haven't even actually officially started yet, right? That's right. I start Monday, March 9th is my first official day. And why is it taken so long because Andy's gone right or he's, he's leaving actually he he left yeah. uh, last week right. I, I just needed a couple of days to to uh, to integrate myself and to finish up old things and start new things so who's in charge Alexander Haig I mean what, how, how, are you, how are you doing this <laughs> well there are, turns out there's 51,000 men and women at New York City Transit uh, who are executing the system just fine uh, but Sally Labrera runs our subways Craig Cipriano runs our buses and uh, Mario Pelliquin who's the COO is filling in for Andy at the moment 50 51,000 51, people. There are cities that are not that big, and, mm -hmm. and that's In fact, how many my, home, my hometown is not that big. Where'd you Nowhere go? close. Charleston, West Virginia. And how many people are in there and it in is, Charleston? It is now about 45,000. When I was growing up, it was, it was, um, it was a little bit bigger. So how does a, a native of Charleston, West Virginia, uh, with 45,000 people suddenly in charge of the country, the, the, the hemisphere's biggest transportation system uh, with em yeah. more employees in the, than they had residents. Yeah, fair to say that I did not grow up thinking that I was going to um, take on this job one day. Um, so I've spent most of my career in government service, uh, uh, working on Capitol Hill, working in the administration. I was the chief of staff at the Department of Transportation in Washington. That's about 57,000 people. And then uh, became the administrator of the Federal Railroad Administration. So I was the safety regulator for the entire U.S. rail system. All this under the administration of President Barack Obama. That's right. So That's you right. have experience in that regard. That's right. Uh, how does that train you for what you're now going to enter? Well, look, um, two different sides of the coin, right? So some things will be similar. Some things were, you know, that I did in the federal government were probably good training for this. Um, some things will be totally different. And, um, you know, I sort of think of it as, as um, trying to be an athlete, right? Be agile, be, be ready to sort of tackle whatever comes at you. Um, I have served on the MTA board over the last year. And so you're was, familiar with the organization. That's right. And I was the chair of the transit committee. So Andy and I actually worked very closely together over the last, over the last year. Were you aware of him being upset because he was he was wildly popular i mean yeah. you don't think of the president of the transit new york new york transit as being a popular person but he did endear himself to the passengers and to the workers absolutely no he did a great job of of being present in the system of talking to customers of talking to our our again our fifty one thousand person um unbelievably strong uh workforce um so he, he did a great job of being out and about and are you going to have some of the same goals that he had? I mean, he, he, he fixed things. The trains were running on time. You don't hear, you didn't hear that. You don't hear that very often anymore, the complaints about it. And you did a couple of years ago. He switched the switching systems, which needed it. It's an antiquated yep. system. He made that more modern and, and they don't fall apart like that. Yeah. What are your goals? Yeah, well, so, no, I mean, they, they absolutely have made tremendous progress over the last two years. So last month we were at 83% on-time performance. 
um, which is not just good for New York City Transit, that's really good anywhere. Um, so he, they've made tremendous strides. Um, job number one for me is going to be to try to maintain that progress and improve upon it as well. And so it's absolutely one of my goals is to continue, continue that. So that part of it is different than your background, the sort of retail end of, you know, making sure the trains run on time, right? right? And making sure they run right. uh, and keeping them up to date. There's all these capital in investments that the MTA has to make. I, yeah. That's part of your job, I guess, to plan yeah. some of that. Yeah. And how is it going to go? Yeah. Andy, I remember sat here and we talked a little about um, the unique part, uh, element of the New York subway system that it runs 24 7 and yep. very few in fact I'm not sure any subway system major in the world runs 24 7 I said I remember him sitting right there and I said well are you gonna change that and he's he pondered and said, well, well, you might have to, but yeah. you didn't. It's, it's, a, um, it's, a, it's, a, um, it's a particular challenge, right? Because if you've got trains running constantly, obviously it's really hard to get in there and do the work that you need to do, to do the maintenance, to fix issues as they come up. Obviously we do, we don't, we don't let things stay broken, but it makes, it makes things much more difficult. So really anyone with experience in a transit system or freight railroad or commuter railroad um, thinks of 24-7 trains as, as, a, as a specific challenge that's, that's tough to get over. And, but boy, just go ahead and try to change that. Well, this is a 24-7 city. Exactly. I mean, this is, this is not a city that, that, you know, goes to work at 7 o'clock in the morning and comes home at 7 o'clock at night. That's just not the city we live in. You, you, do, you have some, some of those problems that have been solved, so you're not going to have to tackle that right away. You do have a problem that's going to start, and it's hitting before you start, and it's affecting the world. And that's the uh, the coronavirus situation. Yep, right. And and the subway is a great little bed of right. infection waiting to happen. How right. are you dealing with that? Well, look, we're transportation experts. So we're experts in getting you from one location to the other, but we're not medical experts. And so the num our goal and the, m the best thing we can do and the most responsible thing we can do is take guidance and recommendations from the medical experts, which we will be doing. So the medical experts at the state level, the medical and disease experts at the federal level, we will be getting guidance from them and we will be implementing that. But you do, it, it is a little Petri dish, right? Uh, at every one of those cars. Any transit, you've been any in transit system is... <laughs> I mean, like I think, you know, people probably, I think people think about a transit system, um, people being crowded in a rail car, people being crowded in a bus as being a particularly, um, uh, you know, an, a, an environment that could, could breed issues. But really, it's, it's, we don't have any evidence for that necessarily. I mean, we clean the cars all the time. We clean the cars um, nightly. We will be um, vigilant as, as this thing um, progresses. And again, we'll be taking guidance from the medical experts. So as they tell us what they think we should be doing, we will absolutely be executing it. And a, and a public information campaign is, is part of it. I, th I think they, they've already put up yeah. signs saying, you know, don't you know, cover your mouth when you sneeze and don't cough in, in the air and, you know, cough on your elbow or in your hand and stuff like that. Right. It sounds simple, but those are really in incredibly important, right? So I have kids at home. I'm always trying to get them to wash their hands and to, to breathe into their elbow um, or to sneeze into their elbow, to cough into their elbow. Right. You can um, tell your kids that. Yeah, exactly. well, we have to make sure that the six million people a day that take the subway do the same thing. Exactly. Right? Exactly. So the expert advice right now is is that you should be doing everything that you would normally do during flu season. Get your flu shot, cough into your, into your elbow, you know, uh, wash your hands uh, vigorously as much as you can. I want to ask you a couple of quick questions that, I, that, that are important to the system and how you're going to deal with it or if it affects you. The layoffs that are going to happen at yeah. the MTA, are those going to affect the subway system as well? Well, listen, Obviously. no, I mean, look, our, the, the transit system, our goal would be for, for, um, for the uh, traveling public to never feel those, right? Um, you know, any time when you're talking about layoffs or changes in people's jobs, it's it's really tough. And we take this moment very seriously. We have to become a more efficient agency. We have to um, execute on our mission in a way that is more efficient. Um, but, you know, the, the steps that you have to take to get there are really tough on people. And so we want to make sure that we are communicating as openly and as freely and as, as often as we possibly can to the workforce, which is obviously, you know, understandably good going through a moment right now when there's not a lot of certainty and they're wondering what's going to happen next. Uh, congestion pricing. Yep. Uh, the MTA, mm -hmm. the subway system, everything is mm -hmm. counting on congestion mm -hmm. pricing to help fund mm -hmm. what has to be done. The governor is now worried that President yeah. Trump is going to hold that back and say, you know, you're not going to do that. Yeah. And you're not going to get that money as another way, of, according to the governor, of, of messing over New York City. Well, so what happens? I mean, I think anyone who's who's watching this from New York or from, from anywhere else should be concerned about the pattern we're seeing, right? So when I was in the federal government, 
gateway, you know, the, the Hudson Tunnels was the number one priority. Mm -hmm. We're still not there because the Trump administration hasn't been supportive. Um, you know, it, it is odd to me that the federal government would insert themselves in a way that would keep us from um, from executing on something that our legislature and that our taxpayers have decided is the is the best course for us. And so, um, you know, I, I remain hopeful. I'm going to be optimistic about it, but it's it's troubling. It is uh, puzzling to a lot of people why the two most powerful Democrats in this state don't work together. It's a little like Rodney King's, you know, why can't we all get, just get along? <laughs> and what could be done if the two most powerful Democrats actually work together? They don't work together. Mm -hmm. How does that affect you? Uh, how does it affect the subways? Mr. Byford certainly didn't like that situation. You know, I, I have not felt that impact. Um, you know, it, it's not news to anyone that um, that I have enormous respect for the governor. Um, when I moved to New York, I had a relationship with him when I was in the federal government. When I moved to New York, um, I called him and said, I have moved to New York City. If I can ever be helpful to you, please let me know. Um, you know, I, um, I find a Democratic governor that's hands-on and focused on transportation infrastructure and the most and the largest transit agency in North America, it doesn't get better than that. It doesn't get better than that for New, for New York. But the subway service is in the city that has a mayor that sh sh should be getting along with the governor, the governor should be getting along with the mayor. Uh, you're not going to be involved in that, is what you're saying? Or no, you're, I'm just saying because I you are tight, tight, uh, closer to to Governor Cuomo. No, no, no. I'm just saying I haven't felt the impact of, of any tensions between them. And and look, it, to the extent that there are tensions between them, you know, I don't think either man would want it to affect the ridership, and I and I don't believe it will. Quick question. It could, I only have about ten seconds left. Of course. And it, it could we talk about it for an hour? Okay. Demonstrators in this city mm -hmm. last month mm -hmm. uh, made a very big deal of one and demanding free fares for mm -hmm. transportation. Mm -hmm. Your position on that? Look, it, it's. A legitimate policy issue. If you want to talk about free fares for transit, you know, take a policy to the legislature, bring it up with your elective representatives. Don't destroy the system. Don't endanger the lives of riders. Uh, you haven't started, and you came on up close, and we appreciate that very much, Sarah Feinberg. So uh, will you come back again? Of course. We'd like to see how Please. you're doing it uh, six months later. I would love All it. Right, Sarah. Thank you so much. Great to meet you, Great and thank you, you. For, for that. Good luck to you. Thank you.